what exactly is the sharing economy? One of the things I never realized was how many ideas you could attach to an idea. And I now keep a diary of all the ideas um, and names that it is given. So the collaborative economy, the mesh economy, the network economy, the rental economy, the access economy, hyponomics. Um, someone the other day asked if it should be called cross-dressing capitalism. So this thing has many names and these ideas are connected in some way. So I'm going to give you two examples that really sit at the extreme of what this idea represents. Love Home Swap is a different experience and basically if you have a home, especially if you're going on long stay or a person like myself, I have two young kids who travel with me, we literally swap our homes. Um, we've recently done this in Oxford. Um, it is a magical experience. I didn't have to bring with a pram, a car seat, a bib, a mug. Um, I swapped homes with a professor who happened to have two young grandchildren. And the interesting thing about home swapping is it does feel different from Airbnb because you create this really interesting social contract with the person that you're swapping with. So you go through many email exchanges over small and big things. So are you going to clear out all your wardrobes? Um, are you going to leave photos of you and your husband in the bedroom? Please remove them. All these things that are actually very important to making real genuine sharing work. Now, what's happening on Love Home Swap, it represents one of the core principles that has got slightly lost around the sharing economy, and this is this idea of idling capacity. So idling capacity represents the untapped social, economic, and environmental value of underused assets. And these assets can literally be anything. They tend to fall into three categories. So you have physical stuff, homes, cars, kids' toys, physical stuff. You then have labor assets, so people's time, skills, human potential. And then you have capital assets, so anything from crowdfunding to crowd equity all the way through to peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms. And what's happening is that we're taking this capacity and we're making it liquid through networks and marketplaces. And it's interesting because this slide started it all for me. It is really important because it shows the two things that technology was doing nine years ago but wasn't doing particularly well, in that we could now create the efficiency to match supply and demand in different ways. But that technology could also create social profiles, reputation ratings, identity verification, for us to trust strangers in ways on a scale that have never been possible. But the smartphone was the game changer because the smartphone removed the friction from these platforms, but it also created all these tremendous trust tools to bring down the barriers of strangers um, trusting one another. So you see these two principles, idling capacity and the ability of technology to match supply and demand through efficiency and trust at the basis of these examples. Just to give you a completely different end of the spectrum. I get to meet many wonderful entrepreneurs in the space, and this was a gentleman I met recently, or I should say this is a photo this gentleman took. Um, his name is Mark Slaughter, and Mark used to sell medical equipment to hospitals. And what he started doing was taking photographs of piles of medical equipment left in strange places of the hospital, so in storage cupboards and in hallways. And then he would go to other hospitals that couldn't even afford to buy, in this instance, one incubator. Now, what Mark was seeing was a classic broken system of supply and demand. And what Mark was seeing was what many entrepreneurs in the space say, you know, how can we extract more value from these existing assets. And he started to dig into this problem, and it's just an example of how profound island capacity can be. So what he discovered was that the average piece of equipment will sit idle for 58% of its entire life cycle. And this results of a third of all surgeries that cannot be performed is because there isn't equipment available. So we created this platform called Cohelo, it's now just been named one of the most innovative health companies in the States, and it takes the unused capacity of expensive health equipment and redistributes it amongst different hospitals. He's managed to take the capacity of hospital equipment from 48% to 70% in the course of 18 months. So here you have two very different examples, home swapping and getting hospitals to share equipment. And they are both 
great examples of this thing that we call the sharing economy. The way I think of it is that it is an economic system that unlocks the unused capacity of assets by matching needs and haves in ways that create greater efficiency and access. And it's those two words that are really important, greater efficiency and access. This is not the sharing economy. I actually love it when people say, well, Despies is the sharing economy, or Washio is the sharing economy, or someone said to me the other day, this Thai subscription service, like if you turn up an event and you have the wrong tie, you can press your phone and a tie will be delivered in one hour. This isn't the sharing economy. They are very clever on-demand apps that represent this very real need to want to get things in real time. And this is the uberfication effect. So there is a very clear distinction between those on-demand apps that are brilliant at efficiently matching supply and demand to give, a th give you things when you need them and true sharing.